So our RTX 3080 review is already up, and now I'm about to die because I haven't gotten any sleep this last couple weeks. But the PCIe generation stuff needs to be answered, and that is more demanding than anything else in my life right now. So here we are, talking about PCIe Generation 3 versus Generation 4 testing in a controlled environment with A-B comparisons for the RTX 3080 and specifically how it scales between the two of them. Before that, this video is brought to you by EK and the EK AIO series. We recently reviewed the EK AIO DRGB360 as one of the top performers in our CPU cooler charts, advantage from its fan performance and high quality pump internals that we found during our teardown. If you're looking for a high performance RGB CPU cooler with longer steady state times, check out the EK AIO 360 and 240 at the links in the description below. Getting to this then, the really important stuff first, this is not a CPU benchmark. A lot of people want to use Gen 3 versus Gen 4 as a bludgeon to hit each other in the various fan forums and subreddits for the two CPU companies. This is a GPU benchmark on different CPU bearing platforms. And what we're doing is we're comparing uh, Gen 3 and Gen 4, obviously. This is easily done by toggling it in BIOSes that support toggling the generation. You could also intentionally handicap it by using a slot that is physically wired for half of the lanes. It would do the same thing. But we are using a toggle in the BIOS for the Crosshair 8 Hero where we can change between Gen 3 and Gen 4. This is easily validated with the PCIe generation test, the bandwidth test in 3 Mark to verify that it's working. Uh, the reason we're saying it's not a CPU benchmark, so these CPUs, we don't run them stock for GPU reviews. For the Intel platform, which is the one we used for the review, it was the highest scoring. That's a Generation 3 platform. It's a 10700K. It's overclocked to 5.1 gigahertz. The point is to the extent possible to reduce the bottlenecking potential of the CPU such that we are able to see scaling cleanly between GPUs without limiting the performance artificially of the GPUs being tested in those charts. This is all pretty basic stuff, so I'm sure a lot of you know this at this point. But the point of it, of, again, not being a CPU benchmark, is that the AMD platform, meanwhile, it's a 3900 XT. We don't particularly recommend it, but it's one of our highest clockers right now. And we turned off SMT because it helps in all of the games we're testing. And what we're trying to do, we also overclocked it to 4.5 gigahertz all core. So what we're trying to do is elevate the ceiling uh, on the CPU side to the extent that we have a chance to maybe see a PCIe generational difference. And then finally, the biggest thing here is that this is a marketing victory, first and foremost. PCIe generation changes. It's a checkbox that OEMs and SIs primarily will seek out for their boxes, for their builds, because customers who aren't in our audience, don't know who we are, don't know what a Linus is, will, uh, although not many people really know what it does. Maybe Yvonne might be the only person who knows what a Linus is, but I digress. Do I, do I get J points now too? So those people who don't really observe the industry might be the ones who would see a list of, well, this one, that's four and that's three and four is bigger, so I would buy that one. So there might be a marketing battle there to be won by AMD potentially. Uh, OEMs and SIs will play into this. They always do. And you saw this with B450 and B550, not actually 550, but B550A was, I think, the, uh, the, the name for it. So B550A was created out of nothing for OEMs and SIs because they wanted a digit that was higher on the box. And that is the kind of mentality you're dealing with when you're marketing. So there's some marketing play here between the PCIe generations, but uh, enough talk. Let's get into the numbers and just look at if it actually matters. First off, for 3 Mark's PCIe bandwidth test, we did observe the expected differences and confirmed the bench platform was properly toggling between PCIe generations. With PCIe Gen 3 running, we measured a 13.07 gigabyte per second average against four passes, with all four actually scoring identically. With Gen 4 running, we measured 26.245 gigabytes per second across all passes. It does work, it's just that this difference requires very specific workloads that are built for this to be visible in reality. For games, we're going to start off with the most interesting result, and that's Quake 2 RTX. This game is fully path-traced, and as a result, really leans on those new RT core generational improvements that we talked about in the architecture video. In our review also, we showed how this game moved from a 25 to 29% average uplift in a 3080 
versus a 2080 Ti to a 45% uplift with some game settings in Quake 2 specifically. That's because it's more RT focused. Please note though that we did this testing with a Gigabyte Eagle 3080, not the reference card, just it was in use getting torn down. So these numbers are not comparable to the original Intel bench, but they are comparable to each other. Here we actually saw a real uplift of 3.4%. Not exciting and probably not noticeable, but it is a real change that's repeatable. At 4K, the Gen 4 results scored 2.3% higher than the Gen 3 results. So the excitement is fading even further, moving from 1080p to 4K in Quake 2 RTX, but it's still a gap. On to the rasterized benchmarks, starting with Red Dead Redemption 2 at DX12 and 4K using custom high settings. The PCIe Gen 4 configuration held a 79 FPS average with PCIe 3 at 77 FPS average. Standard deviation is 0.5 FPS for averages, so we're within run-to-run -run variance. Before anyone gets any ideas, 0.1% lows are also within the much wider variance for this test. The baseline review platform ran 85 FPS average, unlocking more of the card's potential, and it is the same card in this one. That said, at 4K with high settings, or higher settings, particularly those which lean more on ROPS, it's possible that we're limited elsewhere on the card than the generation of PCIe or even that the AMD CPU is binding us before it becomes relevant. At 1440p, we plotted about a 1 to 1.5% difference. This was repeatable across multiple sets of test passes and consistently reproduced. We're not confident in a difference, but it is a reliable pattern that favors PCIe Gen 4. Lows are within wider variance tolerances in this title overall as well, so they're not particularly useful here. Remember, those are really only there as an indicator of massive spikes, which then point us towards frame time plots, and we're not seeing any of that. Our original test ran about 12% ahead on the Intel platform than on these two, but so far between the Gen 3 and Gen 4 platforms, not a ton has changed. There is a change to be had on the Intel one though, but it's not a CPU comparison, and these are very oddly configured for this test anyway. Rainbow Six Siege is next. At 1440p, we observed an average FPS of 319 on PCIe Gen 3, with impressively consistent, by the way, 1% and 0.1% lows between Gen 4 and Gen 3 results. Still, the Gen 4 results consistently led in the benchmarks to the tune of about 1 to 1.3% ahead of the Gen 3 results. At 1080p, this marginally widened, and we really mean marginally. Gen 4 held a 1.6% lead over the Gen 3 results, consistently so, with eight passes producing the averages for each that you're looking at here. Lows are, again, impressively consistent and benchmarking is overall reliable in this title, but that's because of the game. We feel good about the results we're seeing here being different and outside of variance and error. However, that doesn't make those numbers mean something to a human player, especially when you're talking about an average frame time of 2.358 milliseconds versus 2.396 milliseconds. No human will notice the 0.04 millisecond gap. Maybe Snowflake would, but no human. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we observed a 0.2 7% difference between Gen 4 and Gen 3 results. Thus far, the pattern consistently positions Gen 4 at least somewhat ahead, even when approaching variance. In this case, to give you an idea for how low variance is in this test, we've gotten standard deviation for these two sets of passes down to just 0.2 average FPS on the Gen 3 round and 0.1 on the Gen 4 round. The difference is real, but it's also irrelevant. At 1440p, Tomb Raider allows a wider gap to form for the Intel platform, but also allows a widening of the same platform PCIe generation gap. The Gen 4 results plot about 1.7% ahead of the Gen 3 results here. We only ran Flight Sim at 4K, since it bottlenecks on the CPU below that for our current settings. We're seeing zero difference here. It's 0.2 FPS average between the averages, and that's key to remember. This isn't just a few sets of numbers. We're averaging, in some cases, thousands or tens of thousands in games like Rainbow Six, of frame times into an abstraction from the base metric of time, then we're averaging those. So there's enough data here that we're confident calling this one equal between the PCIe generations at least with these settings. Hitman 2 is next, because why not? At 4K we established another predictable gap, but one which still technically has Gen 4 ahead. It's about 1.7% ahead on Gen 4 here. At 1440p, it's even less disparate. The results converge and are unable to be differentiated. But we're also approaching CPU limitations. We won't bother with the 1080p results, but they're the same again. In GTA 5 at 4K, we observed an average FPS of 92.2, repeatedly and uh, with a standard deviation of 0.1, we were getting that number. That was with Gen 3. 
We also observed a 94.1 result with Gen 4, with a standard deviation of about 0.15 FPS average. The gap here is 2.1%. At 1440p, we observed a maximum advantage of 2.7% with PCIe Gen 4, which is noteworthy. But again, that doesn't really manifest itself in a way which should influence your CPU purchasing decisions at all. If you're wondering about a tile-based renderer like Blender, the answer here is that in our testing, it was completely irrelevant. Regardless of whether Optics or CUDA was used, we saw identical results each time. That's it then. Things haven't changed a whole lot since we did this with the Titan RTX, but uh, as stated in our one of our previous videos recently, this is a territory where Intel's more in trouble for the marketing end of it than the reality, at least right now. The RTX results were pretty interesting. The others were expected, but there may be still more room to explore this topic with the 3090s. We'll have to see though. And since Nvidia is still using bridges for the 3090s, going with the SLI shouldn't really impact much because we're not talking explicit multi-GPU here. You're still using a bridge to, to bridge all the communication. So bandwidth shouldn't really be much of an issue in the PCIe interface. But maybe with a single 3090, this difference might uptick a little bit. We'll be back for it. We've got the data now. It's easy enough to do another card. Uh, that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Now you know that the reviews that are published, for the most part, doesn't really matter too much what platform the review are used. Intel has a higher ceiling. Ultimately, though, all you're really looking for was is the scaling the same. Uh, we chose Intel for the primary platform because it allows the scaling to stretch the highest on the GPUs, and we want to see the GPUs as as unconstrained as possible. But that's more of a, a philosophical approach to benchmarking and there's room for both. So you don't need to worry too much about the PCIe generational differences is the point here. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up things like our brand new shirt, which is a GN 1 million subscriber shirt currently on back order as we work on the manufacturing. You pushed us over 1 million too fast. We weren't ready for it. And uh, you can also go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. We'll see you all next time.